Well, welcome, 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 everyone. Greetings on behalf of our illustrious president, Dr. Shawani Howard-Baptiste. We would like to welcome you to the Breaking Barriers Black Men and Mental Health Webinar Part 2, The Impact of Mental Health, health on Black Male Professionals. I am Dr. Carla Moore, Vice President of Programming for the American Association of Blacks in Higher Education. We are the premier organization supporting the achievement of Black students, faculty, and staff in higher education by encouraging dialogue on, on and supporting resolution to those issues which are most significant to the concerns and to its stakeholders communicating the accomplishments of Blacks in higher education to the members of the national and international academic community and promoting a series of programs and annual conferences designed to facilitate support opportunities for collaboration and networking among individuals, institution groups and more within higher education. And so uh, we, as we continue uh, to share this message, we would like to bring a message from our wonderful speakers. Uh, we hope that you will be able to understand the connection between mental health and physical health, be able to identify uh, physiological impacts of professional pressures and learn how to incorporate eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing exercises. And so we welcome uh, for the first time, Dr. Kamal Wright Cunningham, who is a mental health expert expert and advocate for uh, trauma-informed workplaces. He is a licensed therapist and trauma specialist with over 25 years of experience. Dr. Kamal uh, holds a PhD in clinical mental health counseling and human development from George Washington University uh, and is a certified in employee assistance programs, trauma treatment for children and adolescents um, and non nonprofit management leadership. And so, and we welcome back Dr. Jenna Robinson, uh, the expert therapist, international speaker, income strategist, and award-winning best-selling author of The Gift of Grief, A Practical Guide of Navigating Loss. Uh, without further ado, I don't want to hold us up because I know they're going to give us some good message and good words and good inspiration and motivation, um, such as they did last time. And so without further ado, I do turn the mic over to our speakers. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us. Um, and again, my kind of role here um, is to facilitate the conversation. And so I'll be asking Dr. Kamal, um, Dr. Rick Cunningham, um, a series of questions, but we also want your voice in the room as much as possible. And so please engage with us in the chat. And so one way that we'd like to start the conversation is for those of you that were with us, for part one of the series, we'd love for you to pop in with any key takeaways you have from that session, but some of the specific reasons we discussed about why it's so important for us to kind of center the conversation about Black men and mental health, especially in professional settings, right? And so we'd love for you all to kind of pop those in the chat, as well as any questions that come up for you along the way. Dr. Kamal and I have been doing this work together uh, for the last 12 years, and we have a lot of varied experience, but he certainly has lived experience as a Black man and a Black man in higher education and a Black man with um, experience as both um, a, a trauma expert, right? And so we get to leverage that. So um, as we wait for you all to kind of chime in and share your voices, I'd love to just kind of start us off with the conversation about physical toll, the, the intersection between physical um, impact and mental health, because I think sometimes we miss that it shows up there first in many ways. Uh, Dr. Kamal, can you kind of just give us an overview of how stress, chronic stress that many of us might be experiencing um, shows up from a mental health perspective and then how that um, may be layered by racial trauma? Yes, thank you so much. And um, I changed my name in the naming configuration, Dr. Kamal, we're home, it's family. So I think, you know, we, we, we know, uh, credentials and all that and, and everything aside, I just want this to be, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, 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 engaging conversation and, and, and hopefully to some reciprocity. There. So Dr. Kamal, Kamal, what have you. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the first thing when you think of mental health disorders and chronic stress, um, you often think of the brain first, right? Or you think of how it impacts your mind, but we know that somatically there are a number of ways that this shows up for us, right? And so it could be as simple as uh, some somatic responses in the body, headaches, increased blood pressure, 
Um, you know, all of these ways are all of these things are ways that we know that chronic stress really, really shows up for us. We also understand that, you know, black men um, rarely go to therapy. Right. It's it's certainly on the rise, you know, post pandemic that we have, uh, you know, this this influx of people of color in general and black men saying, you know what, something's not right and it's OK to not be OK. Right. So I need to talk to someone besides loved ones, besides my partner and so on. Uh, but just generally speaking, it's still a, a huge gap for us. Right. By way of our ability to access a professional that can help us thought partner, process feelings, you know, unresolved grief and grief and trauma and so on. So I definitely think that, you know, to, to bring it back, chronic stress shows up high blood pressure, weaken the immune system, you know, catching colds often, being irritable with your partner, being irritable at work, like all of these things we know don't serve us well personally, but also don't help us as we are navigating relationships with others uh, in the workspace, at home, with our children. Um, you know, sometimes you, you find that you are less interested in doing things that you once were interested in doing, right? Um, you feel that you are depressed. You, um, you know, don't want to get out of bed in the morning, struggling to get to work. How many people go go to work, sit in their car and they're like, man, I really don't want to go in here today. I know I need to, but I don't want to go in here today. Right. Um, so we're not talking about regular adjustment disorder, you know, just responding to something once or twice. We're talking about layered, uh, comprehensive chronic stress. Uh, that takes a, a toll first on your body, but then again, it does impact how you think, how we process, um, how we relate to others, how we are, you know, regulated or dysregulated. Absolutely. And I would just add to that, that sometimes we think the, we don't, we mistake the stress because we get kind of acclimated to the day-to-day -day of this being what we're navigating. And so I think sometimes what we see in our clinical practice and the work that we do is oftentimes our clients will complain about an ache in their shoulder or their stomach uh, bothering them, right? They may have difficulty digesting food um, and it could be simple things like that. We may be experiencing hives and these things look like um, things that fall under, you know, that you should see your MD about. And then you go and you get your lab work done and, or they, you know, they do some general assessment and they can't find anything biological in nature because what Dr. Kamal is also saying is when he's talking about somatic, it means that the mind and the body, somatic means body, right? That the mind and the body are having a response to what you're experiencing. And so it's really easy for us to kind of think about, oh, that shoulder pain or that hip pain or the knee pain or the joint pain as being arthritis. And it could very well be elevated cortisol, which is your stress cortisol, uh, your stress um, your stress response, right? Um, it's also the reason, especially for this happens for women, but this also happens for men that have what we, you know, we think about socially as this beer belly. Well, that's what happened. And you may not drink, right? And you're like, what, what is going on here? And I can't lose this weight. It may, um, it's because when your higher levels of cortisol are maintained over time, it impacts your ability, your body's ability to regulate and, you know, process food and not store, store everything as fat, but also it compromises your fight or flight. And so it means that you may not respond appropriately when you're actually in danger, there may be a delay. And so Dr. Kamal, what are your thoughts about, um, what do you notice about more recently, some more specific reasons that um, folks may not come to therapy, but specifically black males? And are there things that we might be need to be aware of um, so that we can make those places more inclusive or, for Black men on this call, thinking about finding a therapist, what are some things that they should be looking for and someone that might be better suited to support them? So that's more Absolutely. of a two-part question. Yeah, yeah, it's two-part. Um, you know, and I think um, if we sit and we think about it, the research and the data would suggest, as I mentioned previously, that we are seeing more Black men going to therapy now, right? But clearly, there's still a gap between Black men and Black women and non-BIPOC populations, right? I think that some of the reasons you don't see Black men uh, in masses going uh, to therapy, even though they may need that safe space and that nurturing uh, opportunity to be able to process unresolved uh, grief and trauma is because society, right? Like what what, what, what are we taught as, as young Black men, right? You've got to keep these things inside. You've got to press, suppress these things. You've got to be, you know, protector, owner, uh, you know, head of your household, all of these things can be true as well, right? And it is important for us as Black men to be that nurturing and, and father figure and, and again, provider and protector of the home. 
but we also feel, right? And we also hurt and we also love. Um, and we also, um, you know, are sad and can be sad when we lose people and, and people, you know, things that are close to us, right? So the, the gift of grief, as you, as you like to say. So it's really important. I believe that um, if we start um, really having a supportive and caring uh, community around you, that would be encouraging. So from your partner to your children, to your loved ones, um, as well as to people at work, right? If you had people around you that were, you know, non-judgmental, um, you know, didn't think less of you if you decided that you were going to see a therapist. Um, I definitely think we would see more Black men um, tapping into this, you know, uh, really it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to find someone that you can connect to uh, and speak non, you know, and, and they receive you non-judgmentally, uh, but also they they are clinically trained, right? So it's not, it's not your girlfriend, it's not your boyfriend, it's not, you, you, you know, your, your man or your boy that's just telling you something. And of course, there's a, a, a space for that as well. But we know, as you mentioned, Dr. Robinson, we're talking about layered, chronic grief, trauma, stress, et cetera. Um, we certainly need you know, a, a professional to do it. And I tell people all the time, it's like you don't um, go on Google necessarily to find medical answers. You do use Google from time to time. That would be akin to a friend, uh, a loved one, and so on. But you got to go to a professional. And so it's just as important for you to find a professional that's trained clinically to talk through these things with you and help you, um, you know, forge a path forward. Uh, but I definitely think, you know, really, it, it really starts with um, surrounding your, 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 yourself with people who would be embracing of you if you decided to, um, you know, seek therapy and not look, you know, and, and view you as less, less of a man, if you will, right? And there's, you know, media, you know, media implications and social media and all of these things um, are not necessarily um, kind when it comes to Black men. Uh, seeking help mm -hmm. and, and and crying, right, or letting out emotion, or or being emotional, right. And I think there's a time and a space for everything. So I certainly, you know, personally feel like that's that's something that's in the way often. Yeah, and I for those of us, I know that there are quite a few um, women in this space. And I think what I also hear as an undercurrent there is in order for us to promote. Um, and really support our Black males and going to therapy and normalizing it as a normal resource is that we have to be mindful of the way that we're speaking and responding to Black men when they emote and when they show a range of emotions, whatever that looks like, because they're paying attention to what we say, not only about them, but what we say about other people, other Black men, right? What we post on social media and they're paying attention, right? And so they're less likely to be forthcoming with us if we've adopted a position that, um, or we've communicated an, a, an opinion that minimizes a lived experience they may be navigating in silence, right? <clears throat> we have a question um, from a participant that says, I have a son that may be having mental stress. He still lives with me and refuses to get his own place. How can I ease him into therapy or just to talk to someone? Oh my, that's, that's a really great question. Um, again, I think it really starts with um, providing a safe space at home. You mentioned it, you know, we have men who do emo emotions as well, right? And so mom, um, you've got to really, really provide that safe and nurturing uh, opportunity for your child even to come out. So the first question I have is, is he sharing that he's having challenges or are you noticing it as mom, right? Um, is it mother's intuition? Are you seeing that he's struggling in school, struggling at work, struggling interpersonally? Um, so I have a, I have a bunch of questions, but I think more generally speaking, if we provide the safe space that people can access um, resources in this way, I feel like there uh, would be more uh, access to it. I also would wonder how old your son is and if there are other uh, caring adults in his life that also would be available to be a resource and a sounding board and more specifically be a facilitator to help him get some support, right? Um, developmentally, we know teens and late teens often respond better to their peers and friend groups. Um, so I'd, I'd be curious. It's not un, it's not uncommon for teenage boys or young adults to be more aligned with, you know, an older uncle or an older cousin or an older sibling. Um, but in either case, uh, it's really important that you surround him with love and care and let him know that, you know, if there's an opportunity where he would like to process something or you notice something, um, you know, it's it's OK to not be OK and it's OK to help him get support. Uh, yeah, those are some of the ideas I have. Mm -hmm. 
I especially love being able to leverage the the power of community because as a mother of a black boys, there's certain influence that I don't have, but I thankfully have access and proximity of other black men that can normalize help seeking um, that they admire, that they look up to, right? And I think that piece is important. If not me, then who? Um, and as long as there's someone um, that's available, I think that helps. Um, and we never can coerce people to go to therapy, right? That doesn't, it doesn't go over well. Um, we have a question, and I'll, I'll take this one, uh, Kamal, just because it's logistics. Um, it says, can you provide a list of resources and or therapy networks that specialize in the well-being of Black men? Um, yes, we'll, we will send that out to Dr. Moore. Um, we provided one in the part two, but we've added some additional resources um, as a result of this conversation. And so we'll update that based on the needs that you all communicate here. Um, but we did provide that last time, but we also will update it and send it back out to you all. So thank you for asking that question. And I think I see something in the chat as well. Oh, thank you very much. Um, are you? Are there any thoughts that you have about, um, there's some folks in the room who are in leadership positions within organizations. Are there things that we can do from a workplace perspective, whether we are colleagues or we're in leadership positions that may help normalize, promote the well-being, right, of Black men in the workplace and just normalize seeking therapy and support even before like the, it's on fire, right? Because I think sometimes we think about therapy as a thing you have to wait to do when you're absolutely wiped out or it's absolutely, you know, crisis mode, but we know that mental health exists on a continuum. So what are your thoughts about things that we can do from a workplace perspective, but also from a companion or a colleague perspective? audio. Oh, Dr. Yeah, I think um, I wanted to circle back, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Robinson, really quickly, uh, something that I think is important, especially in this community and uh, in light of who we're talking about, right, us as Black men and, and the BIPOC community is the role in the church, right, and, and just faith in general. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's also another for the participant who uh, jotted the question in the, in the chat, uh, you know, the role of faith and role of the church or whatever, you, whoever you serve, whatever God you serve. Like, I think that's also another safe and nurturing opportunity for your son potentially to find some solace and some care there, um, as well as a safe and nurturing sounding board, right? Like as the starting place, depending on how um, significant uh, the challenges he may be going through. But I definitely wanted to make sure that I underscored uh, the role of religiosity, right? And again, church, mosque, synagogue, et cetera. Like it's really important that you are aligned with the higher power, I believe we believe. Um, and so whoever that is, uh, I think there's certainly uh, space there as well uh, to find comfort and solace as you're struggling and navigating challenging situations. Um, and if we can use that to kind of, I think, pivot back into kind of moving into what does this mean as far as support in the workplace, whether that be culture, whether that be around creating community conversations, what are your thoughts about what that may need to look like, again, for those of us who are working in workplaces, but those of, who, of us who are leaders and may be in positions of influence that we need to consider when it comes to the promotion of mental health among Black men? Yeah, I definitely think depending on... Um what type of environment you're in, right? And so of course, folks here in higher education, and we know the stress that can come with that, uh, regardless of the size of the university or college or, or school, right? Like there's certainly um, pressures there to be uh, leaders and guiders uh, and guides rather of the next generation of educators, right? And so it's a pressure that um, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. We we, we embrace that uh, as professionals in higher education, right? But it does not come with, uh, you know, pressure and, and stress at times. So it's really important, as you mentioned, to find your village at your university, at your college, at your campus, right? You've got to find a village there. And it may not be uh, a multitude of individuals, but certainly some key and critical members there. I think that it's important to talk about mental health and wellness and, you know, and, and well-being overall, right? When we think of wellness, the literature often talks about 
the physical and body responses. We know and understand from our research that well-being is a more holistic approach. So it's uh, financial well-being, of course, it's emotional well-being, it's physical well-being, it's all of these elements. And if any of these things are out of sorts, it can lead to uh, the gastrointestinal stuff, the, the shoulder pains and all of these things, right? And so we can't um, solely look at physical activity, solely look at um, what kind of physical uh, things we're doing to promote wellness, but we really should be thinking about other all the other dimensions and domains as well. So I think for me, finding your village, wherever you are, who can you talk to when you are um, feeling out of sorts or feeling stressed? Um, I also think as a leader, we should allow an open door opportunity for staff members, subordinates to come in and kind of process and talk through things, right? I, I know that it's important for us to hit metrics and benchmarks and all of these things, and they're really important. Um, but especially coming out of the pandemic, it's, it, it's I believe, and we believe it is, uh, we have to be deliberate and, and, and intentional about it, right? And so if you're having a staff meeting, maybe you open up a different kind of way, right? Are there mindful activities that, um, you know, you can do to really get the energies and the juices flowing before you get right into how many students, you know, course pass rates and all of those things, because they're really important. We've got to make sure that we are open and available to provide these opportunities for young educators and, and, and future leaders of tomorrow. But I think we should find opportunities as well to uh, allow for our staff members to be feel invigorated, to feel supported, uh, to take risks, because we know that if they, if they are their best selves, then they'll be their best selves for the students that they're serving. Um, finding a village, allowing for opportunities for culture building and team building, um, I think are also really, really great ways to set the stage so that if, the, if there is someone who is struggling in any way, uh, they feel safe enough to take the risk to come to you as a manager, as a leader, um, as someone in uh, super, a supervisory role. Hmm. That's right. I want to highlight a comment and then we have another question. Um, one of our participants says you may have to build the village if one doesn't formally exist and we don't need permission. Awesome. I absolutely love that. Um, and it doesn't have to be within your department. It could be across universities. I think this is part of the reason that this organization and association exists um, as part of the village, right? But it's also nice if you have someone that's a part of the day-to-day. -day. Um, and so we're thankful that you all clearly have the uh, capacity to do that. Um, even when we shouldn't have to, right? Um, so in the absence of a village, we know how to to leverage and build one. So we have a question um, that, you know, we can tag to you as needed, right? So what are your thoughts on using medication for feeling out of sorts as opposed to a more holistic approach? I like this question. Yeah, I like it as well. Um, I think that, hmm, so I am a firm believer in the usefulness and effectiveness of medication when it's appropriate, right? Like anything else, if you're having high blood pressure, I have high blood pressure, right? And, you know, I go to the doctor, my doctor's like, I got to start you on this low dose of this medicine. Um, and I'm like, wait, doc, wait, doc, how many pounds I got to lose? They say, okay, well, I'm gonna give you three months. You're gonna come back in three months or six months. And if you haven't lost the weight, weight which we know has a positive impact on your blood pressure, then here we go, right? And we're gonna start this low dose. And so I definitely think before we are talking about medication for children, for adults, we should really get a thorough um, you know, screening. Um, are there holistic approaches? Can we change our diet? Can we change our sleeping? Can we change our physical activity? Like all these things we know medically and scientifically can certainly have positive impacts um, on our functioning in general. Um, but if we find for some reason that we're unable to um, make inroads in that regard, then I definitely think, you know, it's important that you seek professional guidance and professional uh, expertise um, as, it, as it pertains to potentially going on some sort of medication management uh, plan. I personally think a psychiatrist is the best route in that regard. Um, certainly your primary care physician has the best and overall um, understanding of where you are and all of your levels and so on, right? Um, but I also think that the psychiatrist has a better understanding of medication management, how it impacts the brain and somatic responses and body functioning and all of those things. So it certainly should be something that's in concert and in unison. Uh, sometimes we go to our primary care physicians and we just take what the doctor gives us. You know, you say, oh, this is happening, that's happening. And you got people waiting in the waiting area. You don't really feel like you're getting uh, the kind of care and nurturing 
uh, that you deserve, right? And it's why, you know, I have a doctor that I've had for years and I, I just know when I go personally, I got to carve out half a day and I'm fine with that. You know, when I go in there, he's doing everything from checking my feet to my head. And and that's the kind of holistic response um, and, and response to intervention that I think we really need to get. Uh, but yeah, I think there's space for both holistic medicines and holistic treatment uh, modalities, as well as medication management. I would just add that um, I totally agree with what you've said. We're, we're usually on the same page, right? Um, and I would add this additional component because I think there's a lot of fear in our community about uh, psychotropic medications, um, meaning that, oh, they're indicative of, oh, that I'm crazy, right? Or is there something's wrong with me? And there's also the fear that we have to be on them for the duration of our life. And as Dr. Kamal is indicating, you know, people come on blood pressure medication and as a result of behavioral changes and maybe environmental changes, changes to diet, exercise, things of that nature are able to come off. And so there are certain, and, it, and then it depends, right? So we can talk about, are there behavioral interventions if it's blood pressure related? But we will be having a totally different conversation if your doctor said you are having a cardiac arrhythmia. Your heart isn't beating correctly. Well, we probably aren't titrating off of that medication because it's not a matter of changing behavior. There's something with the organ that no longer functions properly that medicate or that behavior alone cannot fix. It does need some assistance with pharmacology. And I want us to think the same way about mental health. Depression and anxiety generally are ones that we might use medications to give us a floor so that we can have the energy and the capacity to address some of the things behaviorally, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually even, so that we can come off of a medication. That is a totally different experience. And if we're talking about a uh, mental health condition that has changed the way that your brain functions, such as um, bipolar disorder. Many of our individuals with bipolar disorder, it is a chemical um, a change in the brain that behavior alone does not change, right? It, it can help mitigate. Um, <clears throat> we can help manage it. But most of the time we have individuals that have bipolar, you know, type two that are on some type of medication regimen, because again, the organ needs support and assistance. And so I think it's a matter of normalizing that we shouldn't silo mental health and we have to address the stigma and give it the give us the support that we deserve and desire so that we have the best quality of life possible, right? We wouldn't tell someone that was a again a cardiac patient that oh my God, taking medication means you're weak. And so we want to be mindful of our thought process um, when it comes to mental health, that there's things that we have zero control over, right? There's a lot of mental health conditions that are genetic. Right. So blame your parents if you want to, but get the support that you need. I said that in jest. Um, but thank you so much for that question, because I think it's a big area that um, keeps us from getting proper support. Um, another resource Dr. Kamal mentioned um, going to your psychiatrist. Uh, we know that from a, a, a psychiatric perspective, especially psychiatrists that are trauma informed and that are uh, culturally competent, we're um, we're we're batting zero, right, to some degree. Not quite zero, but they're not enough. They're outnumbered. And so, I also want you to think about um, your psychiatric nurse practitioners. We know that nurses do phenomenal work in all different sectors, that they really are shoring up healthcare, especially on the medical side. And there's a whole team of them in the psychiatric nurse practitioner realm. And sometimes we don't think they have the expertise when in fact they likely have, they not likely, they are required to have significant amount of exposure and experience in a variety of settings. And we're happy that we get to host some of them in their internship period as they're doing that training. I want to, um, one, be mindful of time, um, but also move us back to some of the ways that racial kind of trauma and discrimination that we have likely all experienced impact us in the workplace. I think sometimes we don't think as racial discrimination and microaggressions at work as trauma. It is traumatic. Um, what are your thoughts about how that actually shows up for us? And then what type of support might we be able to need, I guess, maybe to even just name and acknowledge that that's what it is um, so that we maybe don't internalize that or whatever you think happens as a result of being on the receiving end of that. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think you, you, you led with it, right? Or you ended with it. Is that the biggest, I believe, the biggest intervention or biggest response and way to kind of move forward is to name it right it's it's one thing to know or suspect that you are working in an environment that 
microaggressions exist, right? But it's that uh, that 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 secret enemy and and the you know covert messages and the um, you know we, you know in our community we call it being petty half the time, right? And so you know petty emails and and you know BCCing folks on there, like those are the kinds of things that really you know deteriorate the culture in general. Um, but also if you're on the receiving end of it, especially if you are someone who in your mind, and maybe you are like doing a really good job, but you have coworkers or a coworker or a supervisor, um, you know, that is engaging in uh, being microaggressive with you. It certainly could lead to all of the things we talked about initially. Right. And so um, undue pressures and, and high blood pressure and stress and angst and all of these things and anxiety. And we know that once it starts up here, it starts to emanate through your body. And unfortunately, it can really um, be as uh, a deadly as, you know, some other things that we know of that are more overt, right? But it's the covert messaging. It's uh, being petty in the workplace. Like all of these things we know, um, you know, you're up for a promotion and someone kind of sabotages you from behind and, you know, you find out about it in a backhanded kind of way. Like all of those things, um, you know, many people have experienced. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the, the easiest ways is to really, I was looking at the chat as it came up, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it's, it's really important that we kind of name it, kind of own it. Um, one thing for me, I believe is important um, is if you're on the receiving end of it, I think it's important for you to name it, right? I don't think you need somebody else to kind of point it out to you um, because, you know, the, the, there is a potential that maybe you're seeing something that isn't there, right? Or there's unintended consequences. And so, you know, even having healthy dialogue and healthy discussion is one way to kind of get past it. Um, but if you do find that it is something, I think you may need to, you know, leverage human resources, some of these other things. But it's really important that it starts with you to be able to get it out, to name it, to own it, and try to have uh, a pro-social dialogue with the person or persons that you feel may be uh, being micro, you know, microaggressive towards you. Yeah, and I think those repeated experiences can unconsciously or um uh, even behaviorally cause us to be hypervigilant. And so we find ourselves documenting every communication and what happened. It's likely because we've lost a sense of safety in the workplace that many of us have experienced. How many of us have been overqualified for a position and yet we're training the person they're going to promote, right, on top of us? Or we've been in spaces where we often get pulled in, usually by a leader of color, and they're in positions where they're constantly being brought in to revitalize the team or organization or do repair in an organization, and yet they never get to oversee those teams when they're thriving. And so it really means that they can't afford to promote us because they keep us as fixers so often. Um, and we become good at it, and that becomes a part of our identity, but we never get to see the other side and really have a sense of kind of accomplishment around things, right? And I think this leads into the kind of next component of the um, conversation. There's a lot of really amazing things happening in the chat, so please um, read those. I love the um, comment about um, that oftentimes we neglect naming the spiritual trauma and unpacking that piece of our experience. And that's part of what uh, the spiritual trauma, but the ancestral trauma, um, I always say that being Black is, it is a protective and a promotive factor, especially when we have solid identity development around being Black being Black in this country is traumatic for many of us. And I think it's important to distinguish the two, that being Black alone is not the thing that predisposes us at a heightened level of to a heightened level of trauma. It is being Black in systems of oppression and systems of institutional mismanagement, right? It is the infrastructure of what it means to be Black in, in higher ed, be Black in whatever other systems in which you are operating that often creates the, the experience of repeated and cumulative trauma. And so oftentimes we can internalize that if we aren't um, intentional, right? Um, and many of us have heard the phrase of, we have to work harder um, to be considered equal. Um, and that really comes from John Henryism. And I was thinking, um, what are your thoughts, um, Dr. Kamal, about uh, really working twice as hard to prove ourselves? How does that resonate with us? But specifically, how does that impact what success looks like for Black men in ways that compromises their overall well-being, especially in professional settings? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jed. I'm 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 really in this chat, and so I, I want to, as you mentioned, honor all of the comments that are coming through. Um, we certainly um, want to validate what's coming through, right? Because 
one of the last comments was about being overlooked or um, being treated a certain way by somebody who looks just like you, right? And I think that also has implications, right? Sometimes we talk about, and John Henryism is, you know, working twice as hard for, you know, half of somebody who doesn't look like you, right? But what does it mean when <laughs> that person looks like you, right? What does it mean? What is, how is the experience different at a PWI versus versus a HBCU. Um, I think there's also so many different layers to this, right? But um, we know that if you have to feel that you are currently doing twice as much to get and just be status quo, it certainly will have many of the same emotional, physical, uh, and spiritual implications that we talked about earlier, right? It's it's not a good space. You're not going to be healthy. Um, it's going to lead to you having, um, you know, being exhausted, um, you know, being no good and irritable to your loved ones and your family members, right? And so it's certainly an experience that many of us have, have had, right? And personally can say, and, and even as a child, I can hear my mom and dad speaking about the importance of where you come from, right? And humble beginnings, but that doesn't mean that, you know, your your traje your life's trajectory is impacted because of it. You gotta work twice as hard, right? And and that's like, as a child, you hear that. Um, and so while it's important and we have, a, you know, I, I believe we come from from royalty, right? And, 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 and we are regal people. And so working hard um, and attainment isn't something that we're not used to, um, but it certainly can be emotionally, and physically and spiritually taxing um, if you if that's your experience at work your whole life or right, for most of your life so absolutely so we're seeing a lot of expression of fatigue right and what really looks like this having ex having experiences that dishonor our personhood um, our work our late um, and a lot, lots of working promises, right? And I, that absolutely um, impacts your overall sense of well-being. Um, and I think there's there's a comment here that says, I was recently in an experience that really traumatized me and they pretended their organization was safe. Um, and I think one of the things that we are aware of is that safety, one, looks different for everyone, but two, um, organizations claim to, you know, be a, you know, a safe workplace environment, but what does safety actually mean? Um, and oftentimes what they believe they're doing um, to be safe is they'll bring in mental health professionals, they'll have workshops, and yet it is the very policies and fabric of the organization and institution that is unsafe for Black bodies. Exactly, safe for who? That's a very important question. What does safety look like? And who is, is being centered when we're talking about safety? What often means absolutely is, as Dr. Kamal is saying, what it often means is suppression. What it often means is playing by the rules, the rules that weren't created for us, right? Um, and so I think that we come in and, and try and do disruptive leadership and we do come in at the leadership level because what happens when we come in and we help colleagues and you know our colleagues and the faculty and the staff with increasing their awareness about psychological safety in the workplace is it actually just makes you mad because now you have the language to name your experiences in a system that you don't have power to change. And so we know that it requires disruptive leadership from folks that have influence, that have power, that can shift culture and hold people accountable to that change so that it is safe for Black and brown bodies. Um, and that um, folks that name themselves as allies actually become accomplices um, and they get to leverage the privilege that they are aware they have to create environments that are equitable. Um, and this is tough because we are in an era where DEIB is being dismantled and being attacked. And so that certainly contributes to the lack of psychological, emotional, and physical safety at work. Um, and so you are, we want to affirm your experiences um, and we're happy that we have an opportunity to create this space. This leads us to kind of a natural segue um, into the exercise that we, um, created for you all. Um, I want to kind of give you all some kind of background on, on what EMDR is, if this is your first experience. But we wanted you to walk away from this space, not only having had an opportunity to share your thoughts and lived experiences, but also with a tool, with tools, right, that you can utilize for yourself, at work, at home, and even with your children. Um, and, and hopefully for those of you that 
haven't gone to therapy or, or um, experienced it for yourself have some experience with what a trauma-informed approach looks like that incorporates both mind, body, and spirit. Um, and so that's our goal. We're going to spend the next eight minutes on a um, EMDR resourcing tool. And again, this is not the full protocol. Um, it is a primer. It's the part that you can do for yourself. As long as you can center yourself in your body in the present moment, this is a tool that we want to give to you. We also will provide you with a recorded um, version of this. That's just the resourcing tool that you can play um, if you need it, right, for yourself or for your loved one to just help as a um, as a technique. And so I'm just going to, to start that off. We do have a couple of ground rules just to keep you safe physically and psychologically anytime we're doing EMDR. Um, and this exercise is focused on resourcing, which is about building up inner resources that help us feel more grounded, safe, and calm, calm especially in times of stress. It was created um, really to help our combat veterans navigate trauma, PTSD. We also know that it works for individuals working uh, and navigating racial trauma or pressures that are often faced by Black men and women in professional environments. And so during this exercise, we're going to be using an approach called bilateral stimulation, which means stimulating both sides of your brain. Trauma and, and, and grief and mental wellness is a full body experience. And so this resource is designed to really tap into the fullness and the totality of who you are and the internal resources that we've always been able to leverage as a, a collective, right? Um, and so that's part of what we wanna do. So one of the ground rules means that um, you can either tap your shoulders, your knees, um, or really kind of just hug yourself. We call it a butterfly hug. And even just rock yourself in a side to side motion, whichever feels best for you. It's a simple but effective way to help your brain process stress and trauma. And I know, excuse me, that it's going to sound a little woo woo in the beginning, I promise, but I, it's only because it's, a, it's not familiar for some of you, all right? So, part one is really grounding and preparation. So we're going to start by just getting comfortable. We want you to be in a relaxed position. So I kind of just, you know, gave myself a little bit more room in my chair. Your feet have to be flat on the ground. I don't care if you have shoes on or not, but you must keep your feet flat on the ground. And ideally, your hands either resting in your lap or they're on your shoulders in a butterfly hook, kind of like I am now. Can you guys see? I can't see myself. Come on. Can you see me? Okay. Um, yep. And again, either close your eyes or soften your gaze. So if you soften your gaze, you're just going to look right in front of you um, and just have your neck in a, a, a relaxed position, whatever feels most comfortable for you. And we're going to start by taking deep breaths in and slowly let them out. Deep breathing is an emotion regulation tool. So a deep breath in and just slowly let that out. We're going to take another deep breath in and slowly release that. I want you to allow your body to relax just a little bit more with each breath that you take. And if you feel comfortable, again, I want you to gently begin tapping on either side of your body. This could be on your knees, your shoulders, or even tapping on your chest. You can even just imagine tapping side to side. You have options here. The goal is to do it slowly and rhythmically and to keep breathing deeply. Many of us walk around disconnected from ourselves. And so this is a grounding exercise to help you recreate calm and safety. Now I want you to think about a place that feels completely safe that's peaceful and that's calming to you. This can be a real place, a memory, or even a place from your imagination. My son imagining, imagines his world he created in Minecraft. It just has to be a place that is safe, peaceful, and calming. It could be somewhere you visited, a place from your childhood, or a comforting place you've created in your mind, just make it somewhere that feels good to you. Once you have that place in your mind, I want you to really immerse yourself in it. 
Notice what it looks like. What colors do you see? Are there trees? Is there water you can hear? What color is the sky? Is it indoors or outdoors? I want you to picture it vividly using all of your senses. What does it look like? Now focus on the sounds you hear in that place. Are there birds? Are there waves crashing? Or maybe it's quiet. There may be music in the background. What do you hear that adds to the peacefulness of this place? Now I want you to try and feel yourself fully in this place. What do you feel around you? Maybe it's the warmth of the sun, a cool breeze, or that comfy chair. I want you to notice all the details that make this place feel safe for you. As you're experiencing this calm, safe place, I want you to just continue tapping or moving side to side in the rhythm of your breathing and let the safety and peace of this place fill you up. And we're gonna stay here for just a moment. Any negative or stressful thoughts come up, I just want you to gently bring your attention back to the place of calm. Focus on the sights, the sounds, the feelings of safety and peace, and allow the stress to be pushed away. Can you breathe in deeply? I want you to take a moment to just really absorb how safe and calm you feel in this place. And imagine that you can take this feeling with you, like a resource you can tap into whenever you need it. The feeling of safety, of calm, of being protected, it's always available to you. And I want you to notice how your body feels right now. Is there any tension that's starting to ease up? And if you feel any tension in your body, I want you to breathe in deeply and use your mind to focus your breath on that area to help relax it and bring peace into your body. Remember, this is a place you can come back to whenever you feel stressed, overwhelmed, or triggered by the challenges of life. And we're going to take another moment of deep breathing as we begin to return to the present moment. I want you to slowly bring your attention back to the present moment. Wiggle your fingers and your toes a little bit. Take another deep breath in and out. And when you're ready, go ahead and stop the tapping and open your eyes. I want you to, as you come back to the room, take a moment to notice how you're feeling. Remember, this is a safe place you can go to whenever you need it. When you're feeling stressed, whatever it may be, or just a way to start your day. It's a tool that you have with you at all times. Also a beautiful tool that you can share with others. And as you just continue to process throughout the day, I want you to think about what you notice about your body during the exercise. Did anything shift for you? And is there any particular situation or trigger you can imagine using this technique to help you manage? And again, we'll provide you with the recording so that you can access it, but we'd love for you to be able to um, get to a place where you can take yourself to your safe space whenever you need it.
We're just going to take a pause before we recenter back into the room. Love that. I wish this could happen for leaders in the whole community. Absolutely. Um, Reverend Dr. Uh, Wyatt, we certainly bring these conversations to the leaders so we, in faith communities. We'd be happy to serve your folks as well. Um, I'm going to take another question. I think we need to turn it over in the next two minutes to our host. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of wrap with any advice for handling the pressures of being the Black voice in spaces, having to show up because ancestors paved the way for us. If we as individuals do not show up, there isn't a voice for us. Yeah, I think there's a cost to being the only and the being the first to make it that we often incur. Um, I think always thinking about what safety looks like for you. And I like accountability. And so if an organization has told you that a part of their mission and their vision is to create a space of belonging, then I think it's totally fair for you to um, to help them identify their blind spots and, and that that labor is not yours to do. And so I like to ask questions that I may already know the answer to, but that brings it into the room. So I'm wondering, this is how I might do that. I'm wondering if this policy or this statement or this request aligns with what your policy says is a, is a priority. Can you tell me how these two are related because they appear to be in conflict and I give the ownership of that back to them, but I'm gonna bring it into the room, right? Um, and I think that piece is, and accountability is so important, especially when it comes to creating safety um, when we're not in positions of power. Any thoughts about that, Dr. Kamal? No, I love it, right? And I think, you know, it's the open-ended question it is, you know, parents do this all the time. We ask our kids things we already know the answers to. Hey, did you go to sleep last night at 12 o'clock? Uh, I know you did. That's why I'm asking, right? But I I, I love the way you uh, framed it and contextualized it, right? I'm going to center with the policy and the mission. And most often, one of the reasons that got me to this organization, right? Here are the things that you purport to do. Here are the things that's on your website. Um I'm feeling in conflict, right? And maybe, and then I like to put it on myself to to go one step further. Am I misunderstanding uh, the policy, or did I miss something um, in the new guidance? Um, so I definitely think it's important to kind of name it, own it, um, but also ask an open-ended question that you may already know the answer to. Um, but it's really important because you're surfacing whatever is underlying, right? And it should hopefully start a dialogue. Uh, prayerfully, it's a healthy one, right? But it's at least a dialogue where you can express frustration um, and hopefully get clarity if there's something that there, you know, that is a miss. But more often than not, um, it's it's often enough just to kind of surface it and then say it's in conflict with what I the reason I thought I came here or my experience before you were my supervisor or my experience before the last CEO left or whatever, right? So I definitely uh, appreciate kind of uh, bringing it up in that way. Thank y'all. Thank you so very, very, very much, um, Dr. Kamal, uh, Dr. Ajeta, uh, Dr. Robinson, um, for this phenomenal session. I mean, we have to begin to build our villages and make sure we are intentional about creating uh, those equitable and safe spaces um, and environments for uh, not only each other, but uh, for ourselves. And so uh, I don't know about anybody else, but when I did the exercise, I was very calm and relaxed and I almost forgot to to, I stopped listening for a second because I was so lost in my space, but um, definitely we'll, we'll use this, this technique in the future for sure. Uh, so before I turn the mic over to Dr. Howard Baptiste, I just want to encourage those who have not already joined AABAG to join today. Also, uh, you are going to be the first to hear our call for proposals, it is open. And so um, we are so excited. So make sure you save the date for March 29th through April 1st. Um, 
Our pre-conference will be on that 29th, and, uh, which we strongly encourage you to attend. It's going to be some very valuable information. And then we will have opening sessions on the 30th. Uh, so be on the lookout for the ability to reserve your spot at our host hotel because we want to see you there uh, because the party doesn't stop when the conference stops at A-A-B-H-E. E. So make sure uh, you get those submissions um, ready to be submitted. The deadline will be 1159 Pacific Standard Time on Friday, the uh, November 8th. Um, I will drop both of those links in the chat for your convenience. Again, thank you, Dr. Kamal. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. We truly, truly appreciate all of your wisdom and support. Uh, thank you all uh, guests for joining us today. And Dr. Howard Baptiste, Madam President, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. First, I want to thank Dr. Moore. She is our Vice President of Programming for AABHG, and she uh, has really taken that realm very, very quickly uh, in a short amount of time to ensure that we had programming that supports our membership. And so we are here. We are listening. Uh, we have heard the the figurative and probably little literal cry, as uh, Dr. Kamal mentioned. Um, and so we are here to provide support, to provide resources, and certainly to provide this platform to engage in a really important uh, and safe conversation. Uh, as I was taking notes like Dr. Moore, getting really intentional and connected to what you both shared, um, I thought about um, I heard the words layered, chronic, uh, how we seek professional support to forge a path forward. And I think that gives a lot of hope to so many people, whether it's um, a spouse, a sibling, a parent, uh, or even a child, cousin, or friend, that there uh, are spaces and ways that we can work with clinical trained professionals to be able to move forward. Um, there is certainly power in community and AABHE is a power house and it is a community. And so we will continue to build legacy, to build our villages um, and create spaces for us to work on our mental health, our physical health and our spiritual health. And I appreciate the exercises that you all Guide, guided us through. Oftentimes we do talk about the physical aspect, which is important, but I think it's also equally important to talk about the mental exercises uh, that we put ourselves through in a very good and intentional way that are in safe spaces. So we appreciate you all, uh, Dr. Kamal and Dr. Robinson, as being part of the AABHE Village. So you always have a place and a space here to share and connect with our membership. And we hope to see all of you at our conference uh, in the DMV area in just a few short months. So I know Carlita is dropping that information in the chat. If you've heard something today that certainly has inspired you, I know I'm, I'm inspired and, and certainly feel lighter as we engage in this conversation. There are ways that you want to connect with us. Are there are opportunities that you would like to share? If there's information you would like to share, the conference is a great way to do that. So um, you'll be able to click on that link, submit a call, uh, and meet hopefully the folks here on this call and so many more family and friends in the AABG connection. So thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you at the next programming event through the American Association of Blacks, of Blacks in Higher Education. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. And thank you, Dr. Moore. Everyone have a blessed day and a great weekend. Thank you.